Hello and welcome to Faith with Flavor. Today we are going to learn about a nonprofit organization that is encouraging healing from sexual abuse through art. A Quarter Blue was founded by a woman who was also a victim of sexual abuse at a young age. Her mission is to help children and their families become empowered through their process of healing. But before we talk about this organization, I want to give you all some insight on what took place at the premiere of the Rally LA. We had a wonderful time meeting the cast and crew, and we even bumped into a few TV and Salsa programmers. Take a look. As you can see, today the set looks a lot different because we are here in Beverly Hills, California, supporting our very own producer, Rick Reyna, who is also a TV and Salsa programmer with his film, The Rally LA. At the red carpet premiere of The Rally LA, crowds gathered outside of Beverly Hills, and so did some of our TV and Salsa programmers. Well, I'm here to uh, be a part of the new Rally movie and support it and watch it and just be blessed by the movie today. And they also shared why supporting faith-based entertainment is important in the society we live in today. It's just a positive message. It's totally different from what we're getting over the, the TV and the movies now. So yes, it's totally uh, positive messages for our families, our children, our communities. It's definitely what we need. I think it's so important because we need good messages. We need family messages. We need healthy messages. I mean, I think there's just so many bad messages out there that we really need to support good, solid Christian messages. The world needs to begin to see some good role models on um, behind the camera. We even got to hear from Christian singer Manifest about his view on kingdom work. Knowing that it's God's work that's like changing lives like it's changed mine and I get to actually share it with people and I'm watching it like change other people's lives for Jesus so it's it's been it's really life-changing and the supporters of the film were not the only ones with positive comments the actors also had positive things to say I love it all it was a fun shoot we shot we shot for several days in Santa Clarita and some in in Ontario and we've just had a blast it tackles some issues that a lot of people are they're facing in their lives and uh, single mom, three jobs, uh, chemical dependency, um, drugs. It's a great outreach tool. The reason why we made the, we make these movies to reach people, you know, to win souls into the kingdom of God. So a perfect opportunity, you know, it's going to be shown around the world. So we're excited for all the new souls into the kingdom. We even got to hear from Sophia Adela Luke, who acted in the film. She shared how woman will relate to her character. When you watch this film, find yourself in it. Like, which character do you identify with? So um, Sally is just a very complex woman, and I think that there's going to be a lot of single mothers who can really identify with her because of that love for her children and for the work mentality that she has. Sophia also emphasized what it means to be a person of color. If we're Abraham's seed and destined to succeed, we really don't have an age, race, color, or creed. But this is our blessing. Like, I believe that God blessed me being Latina because there's going to be other women who look like me that are going to be able to identify with, oh my gosh, I could do this too, or I could make a difference. And I think that's super imperative. And I, whatever race and color that you are, I believe our color is our gift. And that not to make that the ceiling, but make that the gift that we offer to the world. The, the thing that thrills me, and it's really what this, the, at the heart of this movie, and whole, it should be the heart of every Christian movie, is the life-changing power of the Word of God. I don't care who it is, some high-ranking mob, mob boss, or someone in the lowest depths of the street, the Word of God will change everything. In this movie, you'll see things that are happening, and so there's answers, and Jesus is the answer for everything. Yes. So we're excited. We're excited. Yes. And before entering the movie theater, Rick Reyna prayed for the streets of Hollywood. I declare from this day forward, we mark Hollywood for Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. I declare from this day forward, we take Hollywood back. We take the Hollywood media back for the kingdom of God. Amen. I declare, starting with this movie and other movies, that the Christian media will be taken over by the power of God in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. 
if you would like more information on the Rally LA film, you can check out www.therallymovie.com. Well, my very special guest this week is Martha Nix Wade, founder of A Quarter Blue. Martha, thank you so much for being here with me today. I appreciate you having me. Yeah, it's such an honor, you know, to have you and come and share about what you're doing at A Quarter Blue. But before we get into the ministry, why don't you tell me a little bit about your testimony? What was life like as a child for Martha? Well, my dad was formerly a pastor before I was born. Um, my sister is almost 16 years older than I. So it was a unique um, situation, but I grew up knowing about God, knowing what a special place he had in his future for me. Mm -hmm. And and I grew up knowing the word, and that was just a gift in itself. Mm -hmm. And then at the age of four, life transitioned a little bit. It, you know, as a normal kid, but people would stop my parents on the street and say, oh, she's so cute, she ought to do commercials. So my parents took that to heart, and I ended up doing commercials starting the last day I was four was my very first commercial. Wow. And then most mornings after the age of seven, I was waking up at 4.30 in the morning because we lived in Orange County, getting in the car and driving to Burbank or L.A. where I worked regularly. Mm -hmm. I was on Days of Our Lives for three years. Wow. And the year after that, I was on the Waltons for a year. Mm -hmm. So that was very much my life. I had what most people would consider not a normal childhood. Mm -hmm. I was working. Um, but I loved it. I loved working on the set. And um, that took me all the way through my teen and early 20s. Um, but in those early years, what was happening at the same time was we changed churches and we met a family that was very caring and, and they reached out to my family. And we were in a time of some distress um, because of something that happened within our family. And this family seemed to love us and my parents latched onto that. They had never had children. And so the common thing people would say, oh, God never blesses them with children, but we can go over there and bless them with you hanging out there. And their home was a place that was very fun to be. Mm -hmm. And they had, and I know this is going to let you know around how old I am, but I would swing, I would be on a seesaw, play battleship, <laughs> play pool. And I loved being there because it was really the only place I was able to play because I was working in the day, okay. all, the, all the days of the week. And on the weekend, it was the one place I was allowed to go and play because my parents were very overprotective. Mm. So the challenge was is people were missing what the heart of this man was thinking. Um, while he appeared as if you were a Christ follower, he was a missionary. He was a former World War II vet. He was married to a woman who was also a World War II vet. Um, their heart was evil. Mm. And their intent was to draw these children into their home, and he ultimately violated them. And I was one of his victims. We believe from the age of four to seven, he was probably grooming me, where nothing illegal was happening, but he was seeing if I had boundaries. And my parents had taught me to obey elders to mm -hmm. not question elders as if it were in the word. But if you go to the Bible, it's not there. Mm -hmm. And I obeyed him to a fault where ultimately I became his victim. And I had been taught to obey not only through my parents, but I'd get work by obeying adults. You know, the directors told me what to do. I performed. So this is just another element as a child where I was obedient. I took direction well. And ultimately was violated because of that obedience. And how long did the abuse take place? I'm not sure when it totally started nor when it ended. My guess is, per my own behaviors, that it started by seven because I became um, addicted to things of sexual nature by the age of seven. I know that. And it ended sometime around puberty because I have a memory of him not w wanting to find out that I was changing. And that would have been happening around the age of 12 or 13, where I started manipulating things, started lying to my parents about why I shouldn't go over there. And I used what he taught me in lying and creating a front to not go over to his house anymore around the age of 13. Mm. And how did you find healing through all of that? Well, going back to how I was brought up and understanding, you know, God loved me and had a purpose for my life, I think that's the root of what enabled me to survive ultimately and then be victorious over that. And even though my church wasn't necessarily 
or I don't recall them teaching about spiritual warfare and about principalities and powers that it was not of flesh and blood that was instilled in me somehow mm -hmm. because I have a memory where he was drawing me in and there was a sign above his head that said Lar do Silar which in Portuguese means home sweet home and I ultimately gained a heart for Brazil and the language of Portuguese and have been to Brazil seven times and he was drawing me in and I was concentrating on that sign but I felt something over his left shoulder drawing me to look at it and as clear as day I saw an image of Christ crying mm. and so that was a memory that wasn't clear at that time but as I worked through my healing process I saw that that was Jesus crying that a man was using Christ's name as a mm -hmm. front he truly was a wolf in sheep's clothing mm -hmm. and it was not God doing that to me mm -hmm. but God was crying that this was happening to his precious child. Yes. And that image, I think, really helped me ultimately, first of all, not be angry at God, because it wasn't God who did that. It was Satan mm -hmm. who used a man who used God as a cover. So that really helped. Mm -hmm. And having that knowledge of that God had a special purpose in spite of what I went through, and he'd mm -hmm. use that, that was so empowering to know this was something I could work through. Mm -hmm. And there was something I could do with that pain and become victorious and ultimately help others. Now, a lot of people, when they're victims of sexual abuse or any type of victim that happens within the church or with somebody that calls themselves a Christ follower, it kind of shuns them away from the whole idea of Christianity. How did you maintain your good image of God through all the pain that you endured? Like I said, that memory was paramount. Mm -hmm. That. I think that is what fully allowed me to understand this was not God. Mm -hmm. And so why was I going to be angry at him mm -hmm. for what a man did in his name? That yeah. wasn't on God. And I think people often want to blame God for everything and it's like, wait, wait, Satan is vying for our attention and he wanted to use it for evil. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, because there was constant, I never left the church. I, I went begrudgingly. My parents forced me in junior high. I didn't want to be there. But strong teachers, those, I mean, my, my junior high leader, Eric Hurd and his wife, Debbie Hurd, they were constant. They were an example. And Eric had a crazy upbringing, and he'd shared with us openly about it. I knew that. And then Doug Haig was my high school um, teacher, and he, he was an example. And ultimately, Doug is the one who made the call to me. I was in Brazil. I was serving. I was working with street kids. And I got a phone call and said, did anybody ever act inappropriately to you at church? And wow. my heart sunk because I had covered for him my whole life. Mm. And the only person I had ever told was who's now my husband. At the time, he was my boyfriend. He was in Brazil with me working with the street kids. And I said, oh, shoot, it came out. Mm. And I ended up telling him, a, this is what happened, but I didn't have very clear memories. Mm -hmm. Because many of us, when we experience victimization, one of the ways in which we cope or survive is we escape. Mm -hmm. Like our bodies are there, but we're dissociating. So I explained to you about the sign above his head, Lar do si lar. I remember that sign very clearly. I remember the image of seeing Christ, but I can't tell you what abuse occurred that day because I was going elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I was creating a safe place. And I think God's amazing in that where he gives us the creative being in us because the word says we're created in his image yeah. and that makes us creative. Yeah. And in that creative place, we have a place of escape where we could take in the surroundings. We can have another uh, um, place to go, like a park, where we're still there in our physical being. Yeah. But he gave us one, the spiritual escape to know he's present, but he gave us the creative escape to be able to think of that other place. So. All those combinations of who he created me to be mm -hmm. helped me work through that and, and gave me a goal to do something out of that pain and not blame him or say, what if it hadn't happened? Well, it did, and what am I going to do about it? And you know, Martha, when I first heard your story, immediately the scripture that came to my mind was all things work together for good for those who love God and are called to his purposes because out of this horrific thing that happened to you as a child, you know, you birthed this amazing nonprofit that I really want to get into. For, for our viewers that are watching right now, can you tell us a little bit about A Quarter Blue and what you do? 
Absolutely. Well, first of all, the name is unique. A quarter blue. Um, that's why my hair is a quarter blue. <laughs> I am a walking um, billboard. <laughs> and, but the name stands for a quarter of children will be left blue from the trauma of sexual abuse. Wow. However, education is the key. So it is believed that 95 uh, percent of sexual assault is preventable through education. And so we have part of our work that is educating the public in how to better protect children. We have resources um, that I have here, one of which we are in the midst of translating into Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not here, but it is a guide for adults to help better be equipped so they can empower their children so that they are better protected and they uh, know how to shout out stop and run and tell and understand the signs of what, what a pedophile is doing. And so it gives many tools and it's available on our website, mm -hmm. which is aquarterblue.org. But um, we are waiting to go to print until um, the Spanish is checked because we know that all languages should have these resources because no culture is totally protected from this crime. Um, I am a super kid, is currently bilingual. Um, and cool. it is to read to your preschoolers and um, kids who are early elementary so that they'll be empowered. Um, and then there's The Tale of Gail, which was written by boys, for boys. Um, and it's a story of a young boy who um, kind of had trouble fitting in, but this coach really poured into him and, and how he kind of freaked out when he saw something the coach did and ran and told the fire department, and mm -hmm. the fire department came and helped him. Um, We've Been There is written by girls, high school girls looking back on their elementary experience for elementary girls. And it goes through all sorts of different um, stories, um, including how to be a good friend. Um, it briefly touches on if you're experiencing sex sexual abuse, but it goes through a lot of ways that elementary girls can be better um, equipped to be strong and um, be good friends and protect themselves from difficult situations that they might experience. Mm -hmm. And then SECURE helps junior high and high school students how to be a peer counselor when they need to get help. And that when you're experiencing something tough, you need to get help to work through it. Professional help is, is optimal, but sometimes peers can step up and be the bridge to help get them to a professional counselor. So each of those resources is available on our website. And that's our preventative education, which we can go in and do preschools, police officers, parents, all of that. And then our other side of our work was modeled to me when my abuse became public. My church was an amazing model. Mm -hmm. And it was E.V. Free Fullerton. And they did not hide it under the rug. Mm -hmm. They, um, first of all, did the investigation, turned it over to, to the police officers, and then got us help. They got mm -hmm. a lien against our perpetrator's home, which paid for our counseling. Wow. It was amazing. My perpetrator paid for my counseling. And they also had support groups for us. So Monday night, we as women met together. At the time, there were 10 of us. And we met every Monday night for a year. They also had a support group for our boyfriends or husbands. And then they had a support group for our parents. They understood that the whole family was affected. Mm -hmm. And having have seen that in my own healing process, I modeled that with a quarter blue. So mm -hmm. we service the whole family. Now, you know, sometimes when people are victims of abuse, it's really hard for them to open up and really be willing to come in and share, hey, this is what happened. You know, they might be afraid, they might not want to talk about it. How do you create an environment for them to be open to expressing themselves and educating themselves about this? Do you remember how I said that many of us escape and we take in the room and the creative place? Yeah that part of our brain, the right brain, helped protect us. And often in therapy, the therapist focuses on the left side of the brain, mm. where it's all talk therapy. Mm -hmm. And understanding that we were created in God's image and we're creative beings, I understood the need to go to the right brain to help us heal. And so we really escape to the right brain in therapy quite often. People aren't ready to come in and talk about this deep, dark secret that many of us have kept quiet for years. And so we use play therapy. We bring out Uno or other games at play. We have tons of figurines that they can play and reenact um, incidents with figurines in sand or on the floor. Our therapists, we, they come in jeans and that because they're on the floor a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And we also bring in animals or we mm -hmm. take them to horses to draw out um, the nonverbal of that place. And then a lot of our time is spent in art therapy 
where mm -hmm. they're communicating on art, not necessarily with words. They might explain it, but pictures often say way more than they can even say with words. And wow. so it becomes a safe place to express themselves in art, mm -hmm. whether they be a four-year-old or a 40 or 60 year old. Mm -hmm. Art becomes a safe place to communicate um, non-verbally so that we can hopefully build that relationship with them because a relationship was violated. Mm -hmm. You know, usually that perpetrator was someone they know and tr knew and trusted mm -hmm. and that relationship was violated. So we need to carefully build that relationship and let them know we are safe. And so not talking sometimes helps. Mm -hmm. And so we do things a lot of times where there's no language and it draws them in over time and as we build that relationship with them. So tell me the story about this beautiful artwork right here that we have sitting in front of us. Well, if the girl who um, is watching this heard you say beautiful art, she would start going off right now. That is the ugliest thing. A caveman <laughs> could have done that. That is so horrible. But I have had professional artists stop and look at this and say, oh my goodness, if I had the money, I would buy this. <laughs> and this was actually from our very first art therapy session wow. where there was a group of people of varying ages, both what we call primary victims and secondary victims, meaning um, the person whom it happened to or the family member who it didn't directly happen to but is affected by this um, trauma. So she was expressing herself with her fingers and she broke down and she says, it's not dark enough. It's so much darker than this. Wow. And she just came unleashed and she thinks it's ugly, she thinks it's horrific, but it tells us exactly where she is. She's trapped in confusion and darkness. And if you think about this, I believe, is the place where Satan is really attacking the world, mm -hmm. is he seeps in and he attacks them in a, a confusing, dark way that's based on lies, which is totally counter who God is. God is truth and light, and yet Satan is dark and confusing. And she would say, this is dark, this is confusing. And she is in a place now, this was um, four and a half years ago, and she is in a place now where Ultimately, art wasn't which drew her into a healthy place. It was a sport, but she's doing phenomenally. How are people finding healing through pieces of art like this? They're getting what's trapped inside out. Mm. And when we let go of what's entrapped within us, mm -hmm. we're allowing God to take over, or sometimes humans to step in and to start that healing process. But when it remains trapped inside, which many of us keep it quiet, I did not, sh I shared with, who's now my husband, mm -hmm. I was about 24 when I told him. It became public in 25, so I didn't receive wow. healing until I was 25. Wow. And it's an ongoing process. I mean, that was 23 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I say people, don't, don't worry, this is over 20 years of healing. Yeah. Healing's a process. Mm -hmm. This is not where I was 23 years ago. I'm meeting you today when you're first telling me your story. But hope is possible. You see it right here. But it's a lifetime investment. Now let's look at this one over here. Tell me the story about this one. Well, she is a woman and um, you know she's expressing here that who she wants to be she wants to be confident. She wants to be caring. She needs to tell herself, you're strong, because that wounded child within her feels very weak and vulnerable. Mm. But she knows that, you know, this is the darkness, but look at the portions. When wow. she came to us, you know, like when she first came to us, it was all black and confusing. Now this is a portion of who she is because mm. she's in the process of growth. And she's going towards the light and the hope. And she's telling herself she is strong because she is. Mm. She's learning that. But it's something she needs to continue to tell herself because we're silencing who that wounded silent child is mm. and who felt vulnerable and weak and silenced by a person in a usually a high trust position that everybody admired. Now, is a quarter blue only open to people who are victims of sexual abuse or is it open to other people as well? We have most people who come to us have experienced sexual assault. Mm -hmm. um, our interns sees victims of crime. So it could be murder, it could be domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Remarkably, they, those people who have come to us, not because they were victims of sexual assault, 
as they start the therapeutic process, we can only name one woman who hasn't been sexually assaulted, who came to us for another reason. Mm -hmm. But as they talk about their daughters who were um, murdered mm -hmm. or experiencing domestic violence in the home, they say, I never told anybody, but this is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. I want you to do me a favor and look into that camera for me and maybe there's somebody watching who hasn't found their healing of sexual abuse. Would you just encourage them to get help right now? Absolutely. First of all, you are not alone. First and foremost, you have a God that will never leave you nor forsake you. He was hurt when that man or woman wounded you and he wants to start anew in you. You are normal for what you have gone through, but it's time to create a new normal. God is a creative God and he has a creative purpose to transform you. And whether we can be there for you to help you or you're gonna find others to walk alongside of you, God will be faithful in this process. He's been faithful to me, he's revealed himself to me, and it is possible healing, hope, and wholeness are possible. Hold on to your God, for he has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Amen. Well said. Well, I honor you today, Martha, because I think what you're doing is so amazing and so needed in our society today. Thank you so much for spending time with me here on Faith with Labor. And if someone would like more information on your ministry, where can they go? Feel free to go to our website, accorderblue.org or you can even email info at acorderblue.org. We will be there for you no matter where you are. Amen. Well, that is all the time we have. Thank you so much for watching Faith with Flavor. Until next time, God bless you. I love you. Bye-bye.